Welcome to another episode of B2B Startup Growth. I'm Shaw McHouse, and in this podcast, I aim to share with you wisdom from some of the smartest B2B startup leaders and professionals that I know. We talk about all aspects of marketing, sales, growth hacking, life hacking, and everything in between. Hello, everyone. This is Shoham Eckhaus, and this is the episode zero, season one of the B2B Startup Growth Podcast. I'm the chief strategist and CMO of Penguin Strategies, which is the leading B2B tech agency, marketing agency in Israel. We work with the tech companies, tech startups mainly in the B2B area in Israel and also in the US and in Europe. So about half of our clients are Israeli startups and half of them are from all over the world. Running the strategy team at Penguin means that I meet a lot of tech companies startups every month and uh, I work I have had the privilege to work with uh, dozens of companies in the last five years or so and in this podcast my aim is to first of all communicate with my clients in a way that will be more scalable than to meet with them individually so that I can share with them my learnings from different companies experiments that I run with different companies and share with them what are the things that really work well and what are the things that don't work well and that they should avoid. And I think the unique angle that I want to bring in this podcast, and I'm hoping to share that with the world of marketers and especially B2B tech uh, CMOs or B2B tech CROs or marketers, is the secret sauce, I would call it, that I find a lot of Israeli tech startups have. And the secret sauce consists of many things. And I'd like to discuss it today in today's episode in more detail with Ronen Nir. And this secret sauce, some of it will stay secret because companies that are successful are often not wanting to reveal their secret sauces. But I think myself, uh, coming from an agency perspective and seeing a lot of companies, I feel com- uh, comfortable to share things that are not the private information of our clients, but patterns that I see are common to successes and patterns that I see are common to things that don't work out well. So I'd like to try and bring you this. There is a very unique ecosystem in Tel Aviv that managed to grow a huge amount of super successful tech companies, especially B2B companies. And I've been privileged to be living in the right place in the right time to have been working with some of the most successful B2B tech startups that have been created in Israel in the last decade. And I'd like to share with you some of the learnings. So this is my goal. And in today's episode, I brought the person that I think knows more about the DNA of Israeli B2B tech startup success than anyone else that I know. Hello, Elonen. Hi, Sean. So happy to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. It's both... Uh... A pleasure uh, and an honor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I hope you say that later also. <laughs> okay, so let's start by please introduce yourself to people who don't know yourself uh, and Viola Ventures. My name is uh, Ron Nier. I'm a general partner of uh, Viola Ventures. Viola Ventures is the early stage arm of the Viola Group. Viola Group is the largest technology-focused investment group in Israel with over uh, $3 billion assets under management. We've been around since the year 2000. And basically, you know, we invest in Israeli-related startups and one of the top investment firms out there 
with a lot of experience in the Israeli ecosystem. And to what extent are you personally involved with the investment in companies that are B2B tech related? Personally, very, very involved. That's what I do for the past uh, 12 years. Oh, so that's so good to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Ronen, can you please tell me a little bit about how you got to be a partner at Viola? So, it's, a, it's a kind of a very typical to Israel, very untypical, I would say, to other uh, Uh, to other places in the world. So basically, I had three careers. I started my career in the military, spent 14 years in, in, in the military. And I think it's, it's important for the foreign audience to, mm-hmm. to understand that they, again, when we talk about the Israeli, the Israeli military develops its own technology for itself. That's, mm-hmm. the main, that's the main key issue. So it doesn't necessarily contract it out to defense integrators. But there is a lot of internal development product management that is being done in-house and I've been doing this for uh, you know for several years and this is where I got I think both my indoctrination <laughs> um, you know as well as my experience and I did this until the age of 32 and then I moved over to the industry I did a range of product management roles. The last one of them was in uh, variant systems which is a, a publicly traded cyber security company and and then after that I, I I moved on to to the dark side I would say to to making to making investments really kind of um, uh, you know starting my way uh, going my way up in the past 12 years to become a general partner. Yeah. And I think being doing B2B all of, all of my life, I think that the key uh, element, and I think this is why, why we all always connected, it's, it's all, always have been my passion. I think in general, it's the passion of Viola, is really to take those great products coming out of Israel and turn them into really successful companies, right? And this is this journey, From taking a product to the product market fee to the initial scale phase where we spend a lot of our time and therefore uh, you know think about all of all those issues of how we can have the experience that we have how can we share this with our portfolio companies and in the industry in general because we believe it's a kind of a core element to be mm-hmm. successful. The first thing that I wanted to discuss with you is for the audience, especially the audience that is less familiar with the macro data about the Israeli high-tech industry and what's unique about it, could you give us just a little bit of highlights about what's unique about this yeah, environment? Sure. So... First of all, is, um, Israel and I would say Tel Aviv area in particular is uh, ranked number two in the world, uh, second only to Silicon Valley in terms of uh, new startups that are uh, emerging and amount of money that is being invested. So I think that uh, it's a significant part of the global ecosystem of startup and you know with a significant uh, footprint. Because Israel itself is, is very small, uh, roughly the size of New Jersey, uh, 9 million people. The tech element is a major part of Israel's economy. It's about uh, 14 percent of GDP, just as comparison, compared to 6 percent of GDP in the U.S. So all the U.S tech companies, Apple and Facebook and Google and Amazon all together amount for about six percent of the GDP in Israel is more than twice by far the number one in the world and 50 percent of Israeli export is software related so in many many ways the tech sector is the uh, I would say the leading sector in uh, in Israel's economy mm-hmm. so that's kind of uh, you know on a local scale on a gl- on a global scale we're talking about an ecosystem which is uh, uh, pretty sophisticated and Roughly 8,000 startups that are active today, 
anywhere between 500 to 1,000 companies are being born uh, every year. Significant investment ecosystem. Uh, this year, we're going to probably surpass $8 billion of investments throughout the different stages uh, uh, in Israeli companies and some uh, you know, very significant, I would say, companies and technologies that came, uh, that came out of uh, Israel. So are there any specific fields of technology that are especially strong in Israel? So I would say there are, it's, it's actually an, an interesting question and not so straightforward one. So the, the, the way that we like to describe it is that the essence of, I would say, the competitive, intelli- the competitive positioning of Israel is, being a, is a lot of knowledge in what we call deep technology. Mm-hmm. So things like algorithmic expertise, uh, system engineering, etc., have been around. Have always been kind of the strength of, of the Israeli of the Israeli ecosystem. I think that the nice thing about it, and we'll probably talk a little, uh, about it a little bit later, is that in the past thirty years, which in which this ecosystem uh, has been there. Uh, we have managed to take those building blocks of technology and pretty fast adjust to the different mar- market trends that are happening, right? So mm-hmm. if in the 90s, we we're very strong in, in semiconductor and in uh, telecommunication, then uh, the same engineer could uh, have done, you know, in the, in the previous decade, digital advertising, and today we'll do AI. Right? So yeah. the technology building blocks are the same, mm-hmm. but the implementation, it kind of uh, changes as the market evolves. Right. So actually, you mentioned the sector of AI as an example. Are there more sectors that stand out as especially significantly having a lot of startups in Israel? So again, in, gen- in general, I would say Israel is known to be more B2B focused than mm-hmm. purely consumer focused, yes. although yeah. this is also changing. Yeah. And I think that we have some very interesting growth in the consumer ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And by the way, it will be interesting for you as a result of very good online marketing Mm -hmm. capabilities. And we can talk about it a little bit later. But still, I would say that probably uh, two-thirds or 70% are are B2B related. Right. All the way from semiconductor infrastructure to uh, horizontal layers of uh, IT infrastructure, all the way to uh, B2B application to vertical AI and what, whatever is, uh, is right. there in the stack. So w- w- why do you think, I mean, I have my own little theory that it uh, was established by, from, from my home <laughs> because of my children being now in, in this process. So I wanted to, to, to ask you from your perspective, what is, you think, the, the reason why Israel has become such a hub for B2B software companies, especially software and hardware companies. What's unique about this environment that made it so extensive in this area? So, you know, when we try to, uh, uh, to, to analyze it, we often come to the conclusion that it's a very unique equilibrium between six different elements. And I'll try to name them if I remember all of them, and maybe we can drill down to one or two of them. The first one, which is the basis for for it all, is the entrepreneurial spirit Mm -hmm. and the entrepreneurial culture, which you probably would like to dive in a little bit later. Yes. The second element is the source of human resources, which is mostly the military. Mm -hmm. And again, because of the very unique structure of Israeli society, in which all teenagers uh, after they finish high school, bo- both boys and girls uh, have a, a compulsory service in, in, in which they need to go. Actually, 
think of the Israeli military as one of the largest HR agencies in the world. Exactly. And I think that's the, the most unique, uh, very unique point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very unique, and we'll come back to the, yes. a little bit to, to the other. The third, the third element is uh, is academia, very mm-hmm. strong university and research capabilities. The some of them, not enough in my mind, but some of them find their way to be commercialized as, as, as commercial uh, product. Mm-hmm. The fourth element is the investment ecosystem, which I belong to. So right. the ability uh, to actually free some of those ideas and give them a real chance to succeed. The fifth element is the presence of multinational companies in Israel. And actually, we have more than 300 uh, R&D centers of all the major tech companies in Israel. So Apple's only R&D center outside of Cupertino is in, is in Israel. Microsoft have two R&D centers in Israel. Intel has been around forever. IBM, Facebook, Google, you name it. Every large company in Israel has an R&D center in Israel, which actually kind of create a microcosmos For us, in which in a very small geographical area, we actually get a pretty good understanding of, of the major technological trends in the world. And the sixth and last element, uh, and it is hard to admit, is the government. Wow. And the, and, the, and the government was, I think, an important player, definitely in jumpstarting this industry in the beginning of the 90s, providing some uh, financial a safe haven, I would say, uh, uh, for investor and still is today uh, with a relatively friendly regulatory regime that allows the startups to thrive is a very important part of the ecosystem. Wow, that's interesting. I, I never gave them enough credit for this, maybe. <laughs> so I'll, I'll rethink that. So what you're telling us, It's uh, clear why a venture capital firm would want to be in Israel, <laughs> understood. But what I'd like to dive into right, right now is having worked with a lot of startups, you, also myself, I'd like to hear your view about what makes the Israeli entrepreneurs successful. What, what are the unique characteristics of the entrepreneurs, actually, as they're building their companies? What are the, some of the unique characteristics? Maybe we'll focus on the two first elements that I mentioned, which is the entrepreneurial spirit and the role of the military. And all of okay. That. And I think that the uh, uh, chart with, and this is more of a soft thing, it's hard to explain. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it is teachable, mm-hmm. but this is partly something which, which is em- embedded deeply within our culture, which is the ability to think out of the box, not to be afraid uh, to fail and to try again, and kind of, uh, you know, being... challenge authority and wait 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 take... wait a minute you're you're mentioning a few things each one of them is very interesting to dive into so sure. allow me please to sure. stop you so first thing you you said was think out of the box is that something that startups that are maybe listening to this could they encourage that if their uh, staff is not Israeli staff entrepreneur is from you know from 8200 I think first of all I think it's almost it's almost a must okay I think that most early stage startups wherever they are in the mm-hmm. world rarely get it right the first time right right so I have a they have a general idea maybe about a market failure that what they would like to close or maybe a technology idea that is looking for uh, you know you know a market. But I think that the uh, usually in the first two or three years of an early stage startup, there are many pivots and the pivots could be uh, you know across the board from changing some of the people in the team that found it that it may be not so glamorous as they thought before. It's actually a very uh, hard and demanding work to be an entrepreneur. 
Maybe the market is wrong and we need to do a shift. Maybe we need to uh, think about the product a little differently. Maybe the business model is not initially what we thought, right? So I think that actually one of the key elements in being successful is the ability to constantly question yourself, look yourself in the mirror, make sure that you really analyze the situation as it is and not be afraid to do the changes. And many, many times, startups is a trial and error exercise. Right. And the ability to find this as part of the DNA of the company is something very, very important. I believe that in Israel, it's kind of, uh, you know, that's the default, right? That's, that's the, the default, default mentality. That's the default mentality. Yeah. So in, in, in that case, I think that, that, that that's part of the key to success in Israeli elements i must i must say that later on down the road it has its disadvantages as well right like what Let, let's mention what are the disadvantages of this mentality so so i think you know and and, and probably some of the audience is called you know israel is called by many times the startup nation right and yeah. this is exactly because of the the ability the large amount of startups that are coming the mm -hmm. amount of good ideas etc But I think that as we move along and as the industry matures, what we actually would like to see is some of those startups become very, very significant companies, not just having a great technology idea, but actually being able to sell for tens and hundreds of million dollars and, and, and you know, right. you know, become a significant category leaders in their respective categories globally. And that's sometimes required at a certain point of time. Uh, it's different to manage a company that has 100 or 500 or 1,000 employees than the initial five employees, right? So what could be very good in terms of we are a team of five people, we are very agile, we mm -hmm. think, we talk a lot, we change a lot, etc. This mentality, which is a little bit chaotic, Yes. doesn't work so well uh, when you grow in scale and suddenly the communication channels within the companies are becoming more sophisticated and you need to have some processes in place in order for everyone to be aligned with the vision and the mission of the company, etc. And this is where I think we turn to other places in the world that may be less entrepreneurial in the early stage, but definitely know how to scale a company to the place that we want. So these are the two so, sides of the same. Yeah, company. so it's it's interesting. I also myself see a lot of strengths in the Israeli side for agility and questioning things and being very original in their thinking. And I do see Uh, them very strong on the U.S. side of our clients in being able to put together scalable processes. And so my question to you is this. If because I'm specifically interested in companies who are right now dealing with the, the challenge to scale up, okay? Let's say, for example, a company who's just identify their product market fit. They've got their first few early adopter clients. Now they got their A round of funding and they need to, their mission now is to scale significantly the number of customers. Do you think they would need now to change the leadership team to in order to do that so that they bring in people who are more uh, process oriented? Or do you think that this mentality change can occur within the existing team and that they can, would it, w is it usually possible for them to make the mind shift? This is a very complicated question. And actually, the statistics is not really significant about it. I think that what we have, uh, what we have learned when I started to be an investor about 10 years ago, it was kind of the textbook is, okay, we've got an Israeli entrepreneur, you have a great technology team, 
And then when it's time for primetime go to market and move to the U.S., you hire a U.S. CEO and entire U.S. management. And a U.S. CMO. And a U.S. CMO, of course. <laughs> and in yeah. general, that has failed. Okay. Why this has failed? Because uh, not having the entrepreneurs themselves is changing. It's completely changing the DNA of the company. Right. And I think that in general, we are not looking to change the DNA. We like the DNA. That's the mm -hmm. DNA of innovation. We would like to strengthen management with some of the capabilities that they don't have, right? Right. So I think that what, what is the more becoming the textbook now is you have that. Uh, and by the way, this is true not only for Israel. It's true, it's true also for European startups and, and maybe startups with other mentalities. You really do not want to change the founders unless it's really, really necessary. What you would like to do is, again, in most of the B2B companies, and again, Israel itself, we haven't mentioned this, but because Israel is so small, it doesn't have a local market. Right. right. So Israeli entrepreneurs from day one, they think globally. By the way, when I say globally in B2B, mostly means the U.S., at least as a primary market, and Europe as a, sep a secondary market, mostly through channels, and we can, and we can uh, uh, touch this a little bit later. Product building will be done here locally, mm -hmm. and then when it's prime time go to market, it's best to relocate the CEO to, uh, to the U.S., this used to be the notion, or is it still well, still the notion today? Uh, so I think the, the I'll, I'll try to be, to try to to get to the bottom mm -hmm. line. It really depends on the go to market. Right. When the when the primary go to market is field sales, mm -hmm. you have to be close to your market. You have to be close to your sales force. Still, the CEOs will need over to relocate, mm -hmm. and probably hire. Top talent, US, US management on the go-to-market side, CRO, CMO, etc., right. to lead those efforts. Let me just explain to the audience, when you say field sales, you're referring to salespeople who are actually going out to, and uh, conducting face-to-face -face meetings yes. with prospects. That's the field. Exactly, right? what we call high touch, right? Right. So there are several touch points between uh, the vendor and the customer right. before a deal is being yeah. uh, closed, right? It yeah. could be real site visits. It could be multiple WebExes or video conferences, right. but it's a, it's a high touch, several touch points right. with, the, uh, with the end customers. More, more and more, if we are looking at pure online, yeah. Then I think then the situation is different because this is where a lot of the sales and marketing side are actually being highly automated. Mm -hmm. It's more a science than an art. And as we said at the beginning, this is actually one of the strengths of Israel, you know, having those talented people. And one of the things that has happened in Israel definitely in the past decade is that, which I'm very happy with, because this is what has allowed us to grow kind of to the next maturity phase, is the ability to take those engineering capabilities and not just implement them on the product side, but also actually implement them also on the marketing side, right? Right. So when you see uh, kind of if there are today, I don't know, anywhere between 20 to 25 unicorns coming out of Israel, about half of them you will find the CEO headquartered in the U.S., mm -hmm. and, and but half of them are headquartered in Israel, and these are mostly the consumer, SMB, low-touch model that they actually you can scale very good from it. Right. So just for the audience, um, when you say low-touch, you mean you're referring to products that are sold uh, with the very little individual touch with the end consumer and relying mostly on online customer acquisition. Exactly. And, Digital. and, the, and, the, and, the, and the general kind of division that we do, again, it's very high level and not accurate, but I think it's good enough for 
for our purposes is we start with something which we call no touch, meaning that everything is done over the web, over the mobile. I do my digital marketing. There is mostly marketing, very little sales. And basically, I would like to have the, the, cust- the end customer go through a digital journey in which they see my advertising or read my blog, will go to the website, will download the application, will register, will log in, and will start working without having anyone involved, right? This is what we call a no-touch model. Right. A, a, the, the second tier, and usually and the second tier is what we call a low-touch model, mm-hmm. often referred to as inside sales, right. which mainly means that there needs to be some kind of touch with the customers, but it usually is good enough to have one or two video conferences or maybe a phone call or maybe what's becoming more and more common, chatting right. uh, in real time. And, and the idea is that that, they, is that the product is a little bit more sophisticated, maybe a little bit more expensive, and the customer would like to feel that there is someone real behind it that, you, you know, that can actually hold their hand as they're going through the customer journey. And field sales, we, all, we already discussed, that the high touch that requires multiple points with the customers. The kind of, uh, again, at a very high level, parameter that differentiate between them is the average sales price. Right. So no touch people, both consumers and businesses, are willing to complete the digital customer journey if the price is very low. And by very low, we mean a few dollars per month to a few tens of dollars per month. Uh, inside sales can do be anything between a few thousand dollars a year to a hundred thousand dollars a year. And uh, when you have an average lending price of, you know, north of a hundred thousand, that is you, where you usually require, you know, some high touch model. So in the case that in the B2B area, and most of the companies that I see, by the way, I would say that in most cases, the, the no touch is not, it's not often found in the B2B, right? Most cases that I come across, there's high touch, especially when it's, it's high, vo- high price sales. And what I want to ask you is, if you think of a few companies that are doing a really, really good job at some hybrid high-touch, low-touch sales models. Can you think of some of the characteristics of the marketing teams there that you think are the reasons for their success? Can you point out some specific areas? It's a good question. First of all, I think that in most cases, Again, it's a very generalistic idea. But in most cases, in order to create a significant company, still the majority of the budget relies with a really large enterprise, right? So we have some long tail companies like Dropbox, like Box, like Quix coming out of Israel, which are really built significant and fantastic companies based based mostly on long tail. But still the majority of B2B companies would like at the end to sell to the large enterprise. Right. This is where the big money is. Right. So I think that a few, maybe two points in most cases, and I'm a great believer in this, you should go up market rather than down market, meaning start with the small and medium sized businesses and walk your way up to the large enterprises. It is almost impossible to do it the other way around. And I think for two, uh, uh, for two main reasons. First of all, a product issue. Wait, let me understand before yes. you continue. You mean it's better for a startup that uh, has a product offering to first go to, you know, lower end customers? Yes. 
to sell to them, yes. it's better than if they have happened to come across a deal for a large enterprise. Uh, again, has to be evaluated the case by case, but right. in general, the answer is yes. Okay, so explain why, because yes. it's uh, a little bit counterintuitive, right. maybe. Uh, yeah, because I, uh, I think two elements. First of all, one is product readiness. Okay. When you sell for enterprises, you... I mean, when you start a startup, what you really want to do is to get market friction as soon as possible. Do the customers even like my product? Do I have to make changes in the product? And we talked earlier about the, the, uh, the uh, frequent pivoting that needs to be done in the early years of a startup. Do I have the right pricing model, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to have those quick iterations in order to perfect your model. So what you really want to do is to focus on the core functionality of what you're doing, right? And if you're doing a, a I don't know, a marketing application, then you would like marketers to get friction with it as soon as possible and give you, give you feedback whether the product is working or not. In order to sell to large enterprises, it's not just about functionality. You need administration, you need security, You need all kinds of what we like to call enterprise features that even if the end customer and the organization uh, is happy with the functionality, it will be impossible to go through the different aspects of a security audit, a financial liability audit, a legal process, everything that, that, that has to go. So the first thing is product readiness. So you would like to sell first to the customers that have less, I would say, other issues which are not gatekeepers, or gatekeepers, less, get, less gatekeepers in the process, but also product features that are right. not uh, exactly necessary. So this is the first one it allows. And also, as you mentioned, the second issue is really sales cycles, right? That you would like to have many iteration at a short period of time you're in a young startup you are burning money you have investors breathing out your neck so you would like to get to the next stage in which i can say i have a product market fit as early as possible and that's much easier to do with the early uh, with the with the early customers right but and there is a but when you scale And by mean scale, I mean when you reach $10 million dollars of ARR and you need to scale to the next phase, like how to get from a $10 million dollars to a $100 million, dollars, it's get staying at the kind of long tail gets uh, tough. Marketing is becoming very expensive. There are often top of funnel problems which are hard to solve. Mm -hmm. And this is where you're already mature, you already have a couple of customers, you've developed several features because your customer requested to, et cetera, et cetera. This is where you can start moving from your inside sales team, hire your first field sales, go approach some, you know, some significant customers and walk yourself uh, outside that. The other way around, it's not that it's not, uh, so sometimes there are products which are, you know, tailored to the enterprises from day one. I don't know, uh, products that are working for the banking industry, mm -hmm. right? There are no small banks. So you need to go through, uh, through the motion uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. What often people are making a mistake, and I've I've seen people make it successfully, but very few of them mm -hmm. is to say, okay, now I have 10 banks. Now I would like to go down market and sell to the long tail. Mm -hmm. This is very hard to do. Complete different DNA of the company. You already have your field sales uh, uh, people. The entire sales motion is much longer. The entire sales cycle within your own organization is tailored differently and become, becoming from being slow and heavy to becoming very agile is usually a tougher journey to do than the other way around. Wow, thank you. I, I never thought of that. And that is very interesting. And it makes sense to me 
actually, now that I think of it, when I look at the companies that have succeeded. So what I've learned now from you is that actually it's so critical to choose your go-to market wisely and to choose who of the leads that are coming in, I'm talking as a marketer, right? The leads that are coming in when you're a startup, they often pull you to directions that you didn't necessarily plan. And the, the most important thing is to choose wisely who not to serve. Your tip is actually start lower and then go up right. in terms of the tier yeah. that you're serving. Right. And I, I, I have this slide, which I, which I use a lot in my, in my presentation, which mm -hmm. I kind of, uh, I call it the cycle of bottlenecks, right? Where are the bottlenecks in a startup? And I think... And again, it's it's a generalization of, of what we're seeing, but uh, but again, generally it's true. So your first bottleneck is obviously R and D, right? You have to build a product. Until you've built a product, you have nothing nothing to do about. Uh, and this is really kind of uh, when you get your first funding, you maybe your seed round, etc. Then uh, the second bottleneck becomes sales because. When you have a product, the first thing you need to do is to get customers. And you get to get the initial customers, again, to generate this product market fit. And at the beginning, you don't really care. And even we as investors don't really care how efficient this is. How did you get the customer? Uh, is it scalable? I don't care. Just get me customers because we right. need to see whether it's working or not working and whether there's a demand for them. Right. Right? The third element is marketing. When you reach the product market fit, now you need to scale. And now you need to generate a consistent funnel that will be, will be able to generate the sales machine. And marketing is probably the, uh, the biggest bottleneck that we are seeing anywhere between Companies $2 million ARR and up, this is where marketing starts to kick in. And, and uh, you know, having your lead generation team at this point is crucial for being able to grow significantly. So can I take you to that specific point, sure. the point of uh, companies? And if you're looking at the companies and... Fiola Ventures has some very, very uh, beautiful and famous success stories. Could you think of a specific example of a company that you think did that leap really well, the marketing leap, and maybe share what do you think they did that made it successful? Right. So again, I'll maybe give example of my one of my portfolio company, a company by the name of, of Redis Labs that, that uh, is in actually the IT infrastructure space. It's a database company. And again, founded in Israel, very uh, deep technology. Um, mostly our uh, go-to-market team is currently for the past few years is in Mountain View, California. And when you say go to market team, you mean the field uh, sales? So this is an this is an excellent idea. So, okay. so I think that in general, when we started, yes. it was a purely no touch model, right? Okay. So it was purely something on the cloud. You can register, uh, you, you know, you can register, you can you know open your database, you can start playing with this. The average sales price was low. If I remember correctly, it was about eighty dollars a month, mm -hmm. right? So this something that even developers with the corporate credit card, you know, could easily get, get, uh, get into this. And this really allowed us to get, and this was very important, into hundreds or thousands of customers in the first few years. Revenue was not that significant, right? But we got so much friction with the market that at a certain point of time, you know, we felt that this is the right way, uh, you know, to go, to go and go to the next level. And this is where we, uh, you know, hired the go-to-market team over in Mountain View. 
and uh, uh, we start doing a more of a more of a high touch model, right? And actually, today when the company is more uh, mature, and we're talking about tens of millions of dollars of revenue, that basically we have three distinct go to market. Right, where one is the one is the is the no touch still to attract the early developers, mm -hmm. very low prices, just get them to try uh, uh, the product, etc. And so that's one team which is partly managed out of doing online marketing out, out of mm -hmm. Israel and partly managed out of the US. Yeah. Then we have an inside sales team that is actually managed from uh, Austin, Texas, because mm -hmm. Silicon Valley is just too expensive. Right. These days, and then and then we have the field sales in which in in which kind of management is located in Mountain View, but the different salespeople are scattered all around the regions, the different regions, and being physically close to their customers. Right. So for the more digital marketing side, what do you what are they doing that's working so well? I think uh, on online marketing, and I think that the two issues that we need to uh, constantly talk about and optimize are scale and cost. These are the two uh, two things, and 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 I think that they, and and this is this is something that goes with the company, you know, throughout throughout its process. Right, so at the at the beginning, uh, and this is basically a trial, and it's it's a very analytic, uh, analytical process, right? So you have your different your different marketing channels, anywhere between you know, SEO and content to uh, uh, to paid campaigns to web access and and other video conferencing to uh, uh, events and trade shows. So they you know, do it all. They do all the things you they, mentioned. I think, yes. And I think that at the end of the day, at a certain scale, you need to do it all. Right. Why? Because I... often, often, you find that there is a trade-off between cost and scale. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. And maybe I, I will start from the non-digital marketing part. Most of the B2B software companies, definitely the ones that are selling to enterprise, will tell you that the large trade shows have the best ROI ever, right? This is where they actually can see the customer. If you have a booth, then the customers are coming to the booth. They get excited. You, you know, you pin them down on their schedule for your next meeting. And actually, it provides you both the top of the funnel lead generation as well as the brand, which is something that is right. also important. Right? This is but, uh, easy to. This opinion is very common among uh, companies in traditional and, markets. Yeah, yeah, yes, but not always. Again, not even always. in new markets, when you have okay. to sell to the large enterprises, that's the best way to do this. The problem is. Okay. The problem is. How many trade show are there? Are there right? So if I'm in a specific element, if I'm selling to uh, again, I don't know, if I'm developing a sales tool, how many great sales trade shows out there? There's usually one very big, and then maybe two, and then there are regional ones, etc. So I cannot, even if it's the best ROI, I cannot scale it forever. As a, even if I have the budget and it. so, at a certain point of time, I must develop additional channels, right? Okay. And the same way goes to, uh, and I'll take the other example from the other end, from the other end, right? If I'm using a lot of content and SEO, mm -hmm. then I have a free reach to the people that I can reach at a certain point of time, I've reached most of, most of them, right? So right. there are only so many blogs that I can publish that are actually doing this. And at a certain point of time, it may be, may, may be very cost effective because we know that SEO is the most cost effective one. But at a certain point of time, you reach the glass ceiling of your audience and you have to buy 
new audience, this is when you need to start to pay right. the campaigns, etc. Right. So at the end of the day, those who are uh, the the marketing campaigns which are cheap are not scalable, mm-hmm. right? And those that have a great uh, and those who have a great ROI are not scalable this way, right? So you have to you, so you have to really measure each one of them and find where's the right next dollar to do right to, to, I to. well I couldn't agree with you more on this I I'd like to add another aspect of it the reason why I think you need to do all of them all the different channels and variations is because especially in b2b you have throughout the journey the customer journey, You have multiple touch points with with prospects and uh, especially if it's a sale that involves more than one person in the company but even if it's one person it still it happens over a course of weeks or months or sometimes even years and there's multiple touch points and different channels are effective in in different phases of your journey right So it, even if a trade show is very effective in terms of generating immediately a list of leads, it's not necessarily effective in nurturing these leads down the funnel all the way down to closing a deal. Absolutely. So you need the combination of Absolutely. all the different and this is also and, 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 and this is also I think the way to build your marketing team, right? Mm-hmm. So you start with an, outsource agency that is doing SEO and then you you know you bring them in-house and you use agencies for other things and it's uh, and uh, at, at first marketing is only generating top of the funnel and later on you expect marketing also to optimize kind of the conversion process within the funnel and nurture lead and in the later cases even even market to your you existing install base and support the upsell cross sell efforts of the sales department right so you have to go through this entire motion and have the right marketing people uh, to do so the one more comment that I wanted to say about online marketing in general is that I think it's becoming much harder and cost is, is starting to be an issue and I'll explain why I think that you The entire notion of online marketing is roughly 10 years old, maybe a little more than that. And I think that as we see even in our own portfolio companies, five years ago, if I had a great online marketing manager, I could win the market. Right? Because if I had someone who knows how to do the campaigns a little better than the others, Then they I would could, win. I would win and I could buy the keyboards I want, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Now, online marketing is commodity. Everyone knows how to do a Google campaign in AdWords. Right. Everyone knows how to, you know, that, that SEO has the best ROI and bring some content writers in or go to an agency and, and, and do that. Right. Right. So suddenly we're getting the office customers are now being flooded not just if, if you and I are competitors mm-hmm. right we both write blogs right we both write the we bo- both buy the same keywords in our, in, our, in our ads and actually the customer is being flooded with too much information and since we compete on the same keywords and the same channels it's actually becoming much more expensive right right so, so Google ad- wins. Google wins by the way absolutely <laughs> absolutely Google Google wins Google wins Facebook wins right uh, LinkedIn wins some of those are, are, are definitely winning but it's but definitely we are seeing that the cost per lead is going up all the time year by year by year and this is where I think and this is where I think we, we put a lot of emphasis with our with our companies you it's not the We believe it's not enough anymore and it will be even more true in the, in the uh, years to come. 
it's not enough to have your Marketo or HubSpot or general marketing tool. It's just not enough anymore. This is the basic thing that you need right. to do, but it doesn't provide you any differentiation. Everyone uses them, so everyone right. knows how to manage this. You have to bring more technology into marketing. You have to do machine learning. You have to do AI. You have to do, you have to do automatic optimization of your campaign. You have to have your BI analytics and dashboard and measure very, very granularly really what is the ROI of each campaign and where do you want to spend the next dollars and the next dollar to do this, right? So it's becoming a complex situation. One, because there are more channels to do. Two, because what used to have be a great competitive advantage five years ago is a commodity now. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I feel uh, that this is something that I deal with uh, every day. And yes, not everybody acknowledges that just doing digital marketing is not enough. I agree with you that you got to do more and be in the forefront. And I would like to add to that, that even with, when you're doing the, the must things that you have to do uh, to just be at level with your competitors, you can still stand out significantly with innovation. And innovation can be in technologies that you mentioned. Innovation can also be in uh, the content itself or in the creativity so the innovation and the creativity needs to come in all aspects and absolutely and when we see and we see companies you know like slack for instance is a good example for this mm -hmm. or dropbox or other they have a good product mm -hmm. but they actually won on their marketing capabilities definitely right? and so i think being innovative in marketing uh, but it's, it's a combination of of, uh, of, uh, of marketing, of business model. Do I distribute it for free? Do I charge? You know, all of this, that, which, which in general, there is no perfect answer. You just right. have to try and fail and try again until, until you succeed. But we see that a lot of the companies that are making it are the companies that, as you mentioned, didn't bring just something new in their product offering, but they managed to crack something. They have a secret sauce in their marketing element, and they were able kind of to break this glass ceiling and, and to, to, to reach to larger audiences. So maybe to conclude our episode, I'll ask you about that secret sauce. If do you feel that that secret sauce that you need to have in order to do something a little different than your competitors, does that come from being very experienced or is it a personality thing? How would you make sure that your company has some secret sauces? It's always to say that it's a combination of both. It's the easiest answer. Right. right. <laughs> but... But, but maybe maybe you can think of an example, right. an example but, of some secret sauce that you saw somewhere that might be interesting for the audience that's so, not so again, we have a great we have this great company by the name of uh, Lytrix out of Jerusalem. It's a unicorn. It's a very significant uh, company. And you see, and it, it's kind of, you know, closing a circle back to the beginning of our discussion. Mm -hmm. It goes back to thinking out of the box. And the thinking out of the box doesn't mean just in terms of the product features and the offering that I'm doing to the market. It's thinking out of the box on the marketing funnel, right? Right. Do I take the same slides that I can find anywhere on the internet and do, okay, this is how I bring my leads to the top of the funnel. This is how I convert them. This is how I do, or can I find, can I think out of the box in doing, you know, the marketing funnel? Can I uh, do, uh, you know, an in-product cross-sell, right? Mm -hmm. So 
sometimes the innovation comes I see in surprising places like think of an original partnership for example partner with somebody from a totally different field and all of a sudden that opens up a whole new audience for you sometimes the innovation can come in terms of a style that you adopt in your design a totally different out of the uh, norm Absolutely. style it could, by the, it could be, it could be anything marketing in the broader sense so it could right. be a company name it could be a logo you know it can be a tagline right. that kind of has uh, and anything that will will catch the eyes and will make you rise arise above the noise right and I right. think the the main issue that marketers are dealing with today it's a noisy market very noisy. and and it's not just enough to do the good it's not enough anymore to have a good website and to have a, you know a good tool in place and to have good people you need to have something special which goes back to To this interesting thing that you and I have talked offline many many times about this thing between between being very analytical and very creative right right how do you combine those two disciplines together that's often the secret source to become a good marketer I love that we try to do that all the time I do agree with you that if I look at the companies that are seeing a lot of success I think it's definitely those who can really uniquely combine high analytic uh, capabilities with creativity and original thinking also on the other side on the on the creative side so wow Erlen, you've given me so much things to think about and explore later it's been such a, a great great pleasure to have you and I hope to tap into your mind later on as I progress with this podcast and experiment with it. And thank you again. Thanks again for having me and good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to the B2B Startup Growth Podcast, bringing you the latest wisdom on marketing, sales, growth hacking, and life as a startup leader. I'm your host, Shoham Ekhaus. And if there's a particular topic that you'd like me to cover soon, please reach out to me on b2bstartupgrowth.com and let me know. Bye.